during the Spanish Inquisition. It's then and now, including now, here on History is here to help with history professor Peter Hoffenberg. Uh, welcome to the show, Peter. Aloha. You know, uh, the thing about the Inquisition is, uh, and you have to tell me if I'm right about this, is that it's not that it came from Ferdinand and Isabella. Uh, it was a political thing, as it would be today. What they found was um, that for 100 years before 1492, um, there were people out there in the streets, the unwashed masses, who had it out for the Jews. And they would attack Jewish uh, homes and businesses. Uh, they would kill people, um, a kind of a Spanish pogrom um, thing. And, and, and uh, Ferdinand and Isabella said, hmm, you know, we better, we better pay attention to this because we can uh, improve our, our power position um, if we, if we um, you know, bond up with them somehow and support them. Now, that's, that's a wild guess, but I wonder how much of that could be true. Well, I certainly think some of it is true. Uh, it's not a complete story, but maybe we can try to fill it in. Uh, for our audience or viewers, uh, we should probably provide some dates. So the Inquisition is official starting in the later 1470s. So notice that it prefigures the Reformation. So it tells us that Protestants per se were not targets. Uh, Jews were targets, uh, Muslims as quote unquote a great heresy, and then folks who study the period uh, know that uh, around every corner was some kind of heretic or dissenter. So uh, the idea of attacking Protestants comes later, and then officially the Inquisition ends in the early 19th century in the 1830s. And many of us who don't really know much about Spanish history forget that there were significant liberal reforms in Spain in the 19th century. So when Franco comes to power, Franco is a shock to the system. So introducing that, let me get back to your, to your question. Certainly uh, intolerance and violence, uh, murder, burning of religious centers uh, happened well before the 1470s. It happened throughout Europe. I mean, it, it certainly in, in England or Britain as well. I think what folks um, are struggling with and even in today's examples of genocide or hatred, there's always a balance, right? Between what elites and the governments would like to do and are able to do, and whether or not there's either public support or public indifference. So your comment about people attacking Jews and Muslims and heretics is absolutely true. But it's also true uh, that at this point in the 15th century, uh, we're just creating Spain. There's no such thing as Spain. So you could also look at the Inquisition as part of state or nation building. In that case, it's not really dissimilar from a lot of other, other places. Um, mm. So I would say your, the answer is yes and. Well, yeah, that, that does really give me confirmation in the sense that here's, here's a king and queen and their nation building in Spain. They're, they're part of a process where you want to you know, um, galvanize people to support you, where you want to acquire new territories, you want to have the loyalty of new groups, uh, you're consolidating the country. That's the nature of nation building. Um, and so, you know, they probably had a lot of things on their plate. But one thing is, hey, why don't we get people to come around and support us um, and we'll, and we'll, and we'll, we'll do things that are part of this inquisition, and they will like us for that. They will think we're on their team, and that, that's one way we can have them uh, become loyal. Uh, uh, two quick things. One is that you're right about um, the historical narrative. What we want to remind ourselves, so is that historical narrative is primarily focused at this period against Muslims. Remember that Spain had been a caliphate. Uh, Spain, uh, Muslim or Islamic Spain had running water before any other place. <laughs> uh, Maimonides, the great Jewish philosopher. So part of this is what is called in Spain the Reconquista. We always talk about conquistadors in the New World. They're inspired in good part by Reconquista. So you're right about 
the cultural consolidation and the nation building, but we're also talking about uh, 400 years of internal warfare, particularly against Muslims and then uh, against Jews. I think the other the aspect- Muslim, The Muslims were slaves, right? Spain well, had Muslims, slavery in those days and, and the Muslims were at the very bottom of the heap, right? And they had come from North Africa as slaves. They were- well, uh, well, but they, they had, actually got, they ruled and governed Spain. Spain was a Islamic caliphate. Mm -hmm. Starting in the uh, later 11th century, um, it's really difficult to call them Catholics, right? Because they're no Protestants yet. But the official church, the Church of Rome and its practitioners in what will become Spain, uh, started rebelling against the Islamic governors. And so what you have is a really a three and a half century reconquest. As we know, in the end of 1492, uh, not not only Muslims are defeated, but Jews are expelled. So it's a long-term cultural process. The only other point I'd make, and I think probably your viewers would well understand this, is you're right about trying to get support. But these are also exercises of fear and terror. So the target is also what the group you call the great unwashed, right? It's not just to gain their support, right? It is to socialize them and to basically instill a kind of fear. So it's not just um, I get to pick on somebody else, it's also that I better pick, uh, pick on somebody else or I might uh, be attacked or get some kind of uh, suppression from the state. So it's really both, right? It's public support, but the flip side of that is fear if I don't give public support. So that puts a whole new dimension on the notion of scapegoating. Scapegoating out of out of fear. Mm -hmm. uh, scapegoating was essential in those days, and maybe that carries forward. Um, you, you're not a scapegoat just to put the other guy down. You're a scapegoat because you have to be. Am I getting this right? I, I think, um, yeah, there's a lot of wonderful literature and scholarship on this, but I think that's a good point to, to consider. And in a way, I, I, want, I don't want to draw a strict analogy. I don't want to get us off target. But it, there's a lot of discussion, right, about the American South, where for a variety of reasons, relatively poor whites both feared African-Americans, but put themselves above African-Americans as well. And that worked for government control, it worked for social control. So I don't want to get off track, but if it's for folks interested in American history, you can see a kind of scapegoating done by people who are certainly not high up in the social hierarchy. And so that serves their interests and also the interests of the government or the elite. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we should forget uh, the power of fear. And certainly listeners who, who observe you know, either the show or the Holocaust or the fear now in Ukraine, um, fear is a very powerful historical force. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. Uh, the worry of something happening to you can be as powerful as something actually happening to you. And sure, certainly when the position- Anne Applebaum wrote her article about the, about the success of the Soviet communists after World War II in Eastern Europe, um, one of the essential elements of uh, their success, uh, uh, the reason that people didn't turn against them was just was fear, and that that's certainly Probably the most one important of the reasons. factor. Yeah, right. I mean, I mean, she uh, she emphasizes that, and I I would not disagree with her. Um, I just think that when we look at that example, there were a lot of other factors as well. I mean, some mm -hmm. of yes. well, some yeah. some of those areas had suffered under the Nazis, and so Soviets were relative liberators, and some folks in those regions had been communists or Stalinists. For decades, but that doesn't discount fear. It just means that the the molecule is a little more complicated. But fear is definitely there, and I, I think even if we fast forward to today, right, we look particular social media, how easy it is for fear as a contagion to spread. So we got to go back in time. Uh, perhaps uh, folks will be familiar with um, you know the printing press that certainly contributed to the ability of the Inquisition to instill fear, uh, but even beforehand, 
uh, there was a considerable uh, power of word of mouth, a considerable power of pageantry, right? You know, uh, having public trials, for example. So all of that, right? The, the technologies of fear are different, but we're still talking about the fear and the general climate that something could happen to you. And therefore maybe you better get on board and do that to somebody else. Yeah, so that's really great. It's great to know this. Uh, because it, it sounds to me like this is a common denominator you can find uh, in pretty much every large scale or every every scapegoating, you know, uh, experience, uh, cultural experience, at least in Europe and elsewhere. So, th but my big question for you, mm -hmm. Peter, is so, uh, we know that the Inquisition was not one year with Ferdinand and Isabella. We know that it was going on for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Um, and my question, you know, and it seemed to me that by the time you got to Ferdinand and Isabella, it was pretty rough. Um, namely, you know, convert or die. Uh, convert or, you know, be required to leave. Uh, lose everything. Lose your, your home, all, all your lands, whatever you had. Um, and, and that was probably, you know, I don't know if it was the worst of it, but it was pretty bad. Now, the question I... I want to put to you is what was the dynamic on that? It started. It's if it started at zero, and it wound up at you know the full tilt, auto da fe, mm -hmm. type, you know murderous inquisition in the in the late fifteenth uh, century. Um, how did how did it change? Was it always thus, or did it start out in little pieces and get worse? And why? Well, as most cases, uh, things start out locally. So we're talking sometimes, even with the Inquisition, uh, the ideological religious reasons we think of, because at the same time there are witchcraft crazes and trials, uh, are combined or covered for more local or personal reasons. Um, the Inquisition left us an incomplete but still very helpful historical record. And when you start looking at it, you realize from the get-go there were the heretics, so to speak, but there were also people who uh, pissed off local elites, or there were people who wanted to grab other people's land or property. And we see that very commonly in all kinds of kangaroo courts in history. We see that, as I mentioned, very commonly in witchcraft trials. So one might say, for, for your question, is it began primarily as a local enterprise, quite often with the local priest or the local landlord or aristocrat. What Ferdinand and Isabella and subsequent monarchs did was centralize it to a great degree, uh, try to make it more uniform, have the power of the state behind it. And I think if we look at uh, incidents, I don't want us to you know, get too uh, upset stomachs or a headache, but if we look at similar type of incidents, they often do begin much more locally, more decentralized. And we as historians then try to figure out what were the impulses, right, to centralize it and make it an official policy. So in the case of Fernand and Isabella, the argument usually goes that, as every kid knows from the song, uh, they married. And as they married, they did what many monarchs did in Europe at the time. They fused families and regions. So again, we can start talking about a Spanish crown. So some historians say that part of the Spanish crown was to consolidate and centralize. Secondly, we can see, as I mentioned before, that the Reconquista is successful, quote unquote, right? Muslims have been defeated, the Jews have been expelled. So this is a way now to preserve that cultural uniformity. And again, the Spanish were not unique. You can find examples of this throughout Europe, but other scholars would say, it's a matter of, I now have a realm. Uh, what, what is gonna make people Spanish, right? <laughs> uh, they used to be loyal to these two families. They're loyal to their various provincial landlords. What makes them Spanish? And we think today of elections, and national anthems, et cetera. But part of this was that what was determined to be Spanish culture, 
which was a mishmash, right? Made sure, well, but it reminds me of the Aryan culture in Germany in the in the twentieth century. We want pure Spaniards, right? Um, and and the and the common denominator between the Jews and the Muslims is they were not pure Spanish, so, so we, have to, we have to purify. Yeah, ex exactly. And and uh, Netanyahu, the former prime minister's father, uh, wrote a very controversial, enormous tome, uh, very much in keeping with you suggested, because he looked at the Inquisition as a preamble to the Holocaust. Uh, with I think we want to recognize again. Uh, the use, the pseudo use of science, right, in the Holocaust, the pseudo use of Darwinism, but the same idea that there is some kind of cultural purity. And if you can't get a political purity, which usually was uh, embodied by uh, public oaths of loyalty to the crown, that was a very common form of political purity. There's no economic purity because you're dealing with the birth of capitalism. So ideas about property and money and trade are all in flux. So scholars suggest that at this time period, uh, and I don't want to use the word in too banal a way, but culture matters. So you start beginning to have the consolidation of national languages with the printing press. You have what we just talked about, the consolidation of religion, not just as a political instrument, but ensuring loyalty and uniformity. Uh, the only thing I would add is while we talk about culture, I don't think we want to put culture as a separate realm because like today we have culture wars. They're really about society, right? Who should be a member of society? What should be our relations? So I don't want us to get off on what seems to be uh, an isolated question of religion or race, et cetera. It all embodies what kind of society you want. Well, that's the purification thing, isn't right. it? Right. Right. In the I, I want a century. society that is pure in my vision of the way it should be. Right. But that purity, right, could be a whole variety of things. It doesn't have to be religion or race. I mean, purity could also be uh, the rule of law, for example, is kind of a civic purity where I'm not I'm not asking your race or your religion or your orientation. I'm asking you to participate on the same terms, equal terms politically. And that's a kind of purity as well. But you're absolutely right. I mean, most of history is about some type of, well, I guess we call it identity now. That really wasn't a phrase that would be used beforehand, but something that I have, you don't have, but, but what I have, I am born with. So even if you convert to Catholicism, right, there's still a suspicion that you're not really Pure. We need you to be devoted to whatever is the common denominator that brings our <clears throat> our our social experience together. Um, so, I mean, every government. I'm just throwing this at you. Mm -hmm. Every government is is a result of people agreeing to be bound by call it the rule of law, call it culture, whatever it is. We have a common denominator. We share. We we have um, a groupy thing where we share these these views, and everyone who who shares these views is agreeing to the deal, whatever the deal is in this in this jurisdiction, this country. If you don't share those views, you can't be with us. If you don't share those views, we have to expel you because we are looking for purity, and uniformity, and agreement on these views. Am I am I close? I, I think you're very close. And just a few years after where our discussion began in the 15th century, at least in the West, there'll be um, an expression of what you just said in terms of a contract. So a social contract, mm -hmm. uh, meaning though, right? Whoever violates the contract, the contract is null and void. So that's taking your um, philosophical point which could, of course, be through coercion, right? We could use coercion to promote, all right? But here, uh, and I think certainly in the West, where the West has gone, um, the notion of a social contract still binds people. And you can see with our problems in the country today, right? Our social contract is free for the United States. Uh, the, Spanish, the Spanish were just 
creating their notion of some kind of contractual or coercive relationship. Because as I mentioned, there's no there's no Spain. So there's no, you couldn't call somebody Spanish. It would make no sense. Now, starting in the later 15th century, and there are plenty of people who still don't want to be called Spanish. I mean, look at the Basques, for example. They don't want to have any part of Spain. So it's still an ongoing, like so many cases, Scotland and Britain, right? <laughs> Parts of France, uh, the blue states or red states. Yeah. I remember in studying Carmen, the opera, mm -hmm. um, one of the, which was a study of it's a, a 19th century French study of 18th century Spanish culture. And one of the elements uh, when you study the opera, you find is that they looked down on the Spaniard. They looked down on the Spanish culture, thought it was inferior, um, and thought that, that you know those people would never actually be as as sophisticated mm -hmm. and culturally developed as as the French culture. Um, and that and that's now that's the way the the guys who wrote the opera looked at it. Um, but I think it reflects uh, you know the the French view of the Spaniards at the time. And I think. In appreciating what you're saying, I think we have to we have to look at Spain as just developing the social compact, um, just developing this notion of consolidating under under the monarchy, and just um, and, and then figuring out how to exclude the people who somehow threaten you. Um, but you know what is remarkable, though, is I would guess from the period where the Inquisition arguably began in the local communities and so forth it was not am i right it was not that violent by the time it got to ferdinand and isabella it had been mechanized it had industrialized if you will made uniform and really creative at torturing and killing people wholesale in other words as it got more mm, mm, part of the state mechanism mm -hmm. it got it got worse in terms of dealing with the humanity involved am i right I would say right with uh, just a slight question mark because uh, we don't know a lot about the local events. Uh, more, I mean, we would like to know more, uh, but we're dealing uh, particularly in Spain at that time period, 13th, 14th century, very low literacy, very low reporting. So we have oral history. The response would be, I think, I think you are right with the addition that, as I like to tell my students, you can do a lot of damage with farm tools. So in other words, you can do a lot of damage locally without the Mel Brooks type uh, torture mechanisms that he made fun of in, in the history of the world. So I, I think you're right about um, the consolidation of technology. Uh, what you might say is it becomes more of a stage in a theater, right? And that's part of fear, theater. Uh, the only point I would make is I, I would not uh, limit the amount of violence and hatred and damage that can be done locally. It just may not be done in such a seemingly sophisticated manner. Um, and we see this after World War II, where people take into their own hands uh, what are essentially war crime trials. I mean, they drag French collaborators out, right? They shave their heads, <coughs> throw them into pits. Um, it's violent. I don't think we could disagree, but it's more localized violence with the tools you have at your at your hand. Mm -hmm. um, for example, witches witches in Britain uh, were hanged locally, whereas yeah, probably in London they would have been tortured and then hanged. But the end result is the same, right? You're you're, you're still same, hanged. but but you yeah. know you wonder why people needed to do the torture if they were going to kill them anyway. Uh, um, where very does very importantly, yeah, there's yeah. a there's a good answer. For that, and I think, um, well, I would say there's several answers, but let me give you my answer as a historian. Um, during this time period, uh, particularly in Europe, I'm not, I can't really talk about uh, Hinduism or Buddhism uh, and other non-Western religions, but in in Europe, the understanding was that the body is a vessel for the soul. So if you tortured and abused the body of an individual, that soul would either go to hell or purgatory, would not go to heaven. Now, that doesn't discount, right, sadomasochism, right? 
it, it doesn't discount uh, the need for theater, but there is a religious uh, and philosophical reason to deface the body. So for example, Protestants, just a few years later, the Reformation will start in 1517, just 30 years later, uh, Protestants will very often attack Catholic buildings and burn down churches. Because for Protestants, Catholicism was an institutional heresy. For Catholics, they tortured Protestant bodies to prevent those souls from going to heaven. So torture, I mean, I, I know this sounds kind of absurd and certainly in the 21st century, you wouldn't want to advocate this, uh, but torture made intellectual sense in that world. Um, it's one of the things the Enlightenment argued against torture. Beccaria, the Italian uh, legal theorists, argued against it. I mean, you could say uh, U.S. Constitution, right? Allegedly uh, is against cruel and unusual punishment, right? And the most specific example in the 18th century of that was torture. So you could say we, we have to again get back into the minds of the time period, put aside our very reasonable and I hopeful shared morality and ethics and and ask why why was torture practiced and i think we've suggested it was helpful for the state as far as theater and fear and it made perfect sense if you had a heretic you did not want that heretic soul going to heaven now in catholicism though there was an alternative movement we might see it um born in liberation theology in the 20th century that you cannot torture somebody uh, because if you want them to convert, for example, you cannot torture them into conversion. It has to be an exercise in free will. So well, that's, like, that's like the whole the whole criminal thing. You can't torture a, a, a somebody who is suspected of a crime uh, and and wind up with a valid confession. Right, and in and in this case. The advocates of that view generally said it was okay to torture Jews <laughs> and Muslims and Protestants because they had already made up their mind. But now as you, the Inquisition goes to the New World and the Inquisition uh, deals with Native Americans and the potential for Native Americans to be converted, there's a very powerful argument you should not torture Native Americans. It's not their choice not to be. Christian, they never had the choice, they should exercise free will. So the Inquisition says, you know, okay, but we have Jews and Protestants and Muslims, plus the blokes and property we want, and torture uh, certainly was part of it. Um, I think, again, most historians would say that the Inquisition uh, suffered in good part from bad public relations. Uh, <laughs> In other words, uh, there is a legend that came out of the New World called uh, La Leyenda Negra, which is known as the Black Legend, which is the Spanish were worse than anybody else. And so the French and the Dutch and the Portuguese and the British and the Scots could all feel, oh, okay, we're doing some bad things, but the Spanish are always worse. And I think the Spanish Inquisition and even Franco, while not in any way whitewashing them, have also, to a certain degree, made those uh, the apex of the movements. And nobody would deny how horrible they are, but the mirror needs to reflect that, you know, the British and the Portuguese and the Dutch all had their compliments or analogies. I mean, certainly in the New World, uh, you didn't want to be colonized by any European of any religious strain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So brutal. And, and, and you, you mentioned before that at least part of that was sadomasochism, and I, and I believe sadomasochism I, is I an think important so. I just, part of it. Important yeah, part I mean, of it. Uh, it defines humanity in so many, it justifies and explains so many events that have taken place through history, no? Um, I think we should have another show about that with somebody who's a little better informed about uh, psychology and psychiatry. I, I think you're right. At some point with some practitioners, it becomes an obsession. It becomes an appetite. That's clearly so with some. I don't think it provides enough of an overall historical view. Uh, the easy conclusion might be 
that each society has decided that some group of individuals are not human, however human is defined. And then they're allowed to do extra human things to those people. But that only opens up the question, right? How does, how does each society, what group it is, is covered? And after all, there are ways to um, be sadomasochistic, which are mental and psychological. Like my, my assigning an excessive amount of reading to my students. I don't want to physically torture them, but certainly. So again, you open up a really interesting question, maybe another show about the uh, psychiatric and psychological elements in what we call intolerance yeah. and certainly acting on that intolerance. Now, you know, I met a, uh, a law professor out of Columbia a few years ago uh, who had the distinction of teaching a course called torture. One last question I wanted to ask you, and uh, I didn't want you to, to leave this hanging. You said <clears throat> that it, it started well before 1492, but it didn't actually end until the first few decades of the 19th century. 1834 is the official date. And uh, yeah, and uh, it's just that just blows my mind. It means it was going on for four or five hundred years. Um, uh, and um, what 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 was the dynamic there? How did it wind up stopping? Mm -hmm. Was it in some edict? Was it a change in the, the, the views of people? Was it was it only in Spain that it ended in 1834? Was it elsewhere? Um, why do you say 1834? Okay, so very quickly, um, it ebbed and flowed. So like all movements in history that are several hundred years old, it's not the same every day. So it's like a virus. It's a virus and um, it could be under control, it could be limited, et cetera. And I think most historians, again, I, that's an overused phrase, I apologize. The scholarship says that the images we have of the Inquisition are generally late 15th, 16th, early 17th century. And then subsequently with a stronger Spanish state, an interest in the Spanish state in its colonies and fighting the Ottomans, not internal Muslims or Jews, uh, what we think of the Inquisition is either um, is expressed in different ways, right, by formal royal edict, uh, but certainly doesn't have the intensity by any means at all. 1834 makes sense because, um, as I suggested at the start, uh, Spain was undergoing liberal reforms late 18th century and throughout the 19th century. It's a, Spain remains a battleground, like those of us you know, who know about Franco, that's, it's still a battleground. And, and to a great degree, uh, the liberals never truly won in Spain. But having said that, they made significant reforms. Uh, one would say, if, if you're interested in reading about it, you could say that the end of the Inquisition is an example of the Enlightenment influencing uh, Spain. Uh, many of these ideas were brought from the French, some were brought with Napoleon. And so the conclusion really is that uh, Spain becomes more liberal in the 18th and, uh, and early 19th centuries, uh, continues being liberal, um, and by 1898, as we all know, it loses most of its empire. But by 1898, it was a very different Spain than 100, 120 years uh, before. Now, having said that, right, having said that, it's hard to look at Franco's Spain as not really another chapter in the Inquisition's culture wars, right? Uh, Franco uh, embraced the Catholic Church, the clergy embraced him common uh, Roman Catholic peasants embraced the regime and they attacked all the people you had mentioned who would be viruses, right? Uh, socialists, communists, Republicans, uh, gay writers like Lorca. Uh, and that was another cultural purge which called upon in many ways what was considered the Spanish golden age. And the Inquisition was associated in that mythology with the Spanish golden age. So. That's why I thought then and now as our title, because you know Franco only, only died in 1975. That's not that long ago. And you see as Spain tries to deal with Franco's regime and the memories of Franco's regime, 
they're dealing with a lot of the ghosts from the Inquisition. Uh, wow. Yeah. But let's leave it there, Peter. That's okay, thank you very much. Revelationary, and, and I would like to spend some time with you on one offshoot of this discussion, and that is colonialism. Uh, and how this kind of cultural violence played a role in 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 gaining colonies and in losing them. Absolutely. So much, so much. We have miles to go. Yes. Thank you, Dr. My, Peter Hoppe, historian at UH Manoa. Aloha. Take care. Be healthy. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.